There's a ton of YA to film adaptations going on right now. Can you tell me what you think about this book is going to make it stand out? Uh, maybe because we don't think of it as a YA adaptation to a film. I mean, I just was drawn into the story itself uh, without ever considering it, considering it being a YA book. You know, it's. Uh, I don't think people go and say, oh, let's go and see this young adult movie. I think people just are fascinated by it the visuals and the story. So when you look at something like the success of The Hunger Games versus the non-success of some other properties out there, are you taking anything from that? Like, anything encouraging or anything to steer clear of? <clears throat> I don't know. I, I think it's hard to to speak up or down about other movies. There's so many reasons why movies work or they don't work. What we've tried to do at least is is be really true to the book and made sure that people who hadn't read the book also wanted, you know, came out of the movie understanding everything. And how is it adapting the book? Because there's a lot in it that's cinematic, but there's other things that aren't. Then you want the fans to, for you to stay true to the book. So do you have any examples of maybe things that you twisted a little to make sure you could include or things that just had to come out? Well, there's uh, quite a few things that had to come out. Um, there's also a few things in the book where we all agreed that reads really well, but on a movie, it it doesn't really play within the reality that we wanted wanted to have the movie live inside of. Because uh, we wanted the movie to feel really real and relatable. Um, but we work really closely with Cassandra on these things, and, and she's kind of the keeper of the of the Holy Grail. So once once we found solutions with her, I think we ended up in a good balance. Do you have an example of one of those solutions? Something you guys worked out together? Um, I don't want to spoil anything. <laughs> but I can understand that. Yeah, no, but there are there are uh, solutions that we did where we felt like you know we had to make the solutions just out of practical reasons, but also the third act of the movie takes place in a place where you're familiar, you know. In, in Star Wars, it'd be awkward if the third act was not the Death Star, but it was just somewhere random, totally somewhere else. That works in a book, but in the movie we had to kind of bring that back to the place where we'd been spent all the, mo the, the movie time. That's one of those little things I can say. <laughs> and how much of what we're going to see on screen was actually on the set? Oh, Versus everything. Versus green screen. No, no, everything. There's, we've just used set extension a couple of times, uh, but Everything is there. Everything was locations, or it was built, or yeah, it's all there. And how is that for your camera? Was anything designed specifically for certain visuals you wanted to achieve? Well, we first of all we shot on film, which is actually quite unusual these days. I did not know that. <laughs> no, it's all shot on 35 mil beautiful Panavision. Because um, for me, it's also a romantic movie, so I just wanted it to have that texture of, of the old movies. Um, and we just made sure, you know, the the sets had a kind of romantic darkness to them. You know, I didn't want it to just be a dark movie, but I just wanted it to be a really fascinating movie. And how does shooting on film, I, I guess, change everything else about the production? Maybe even just the amount of takes you can do. Does it minimize that at all? <clears throat> well, it, you know, I've shot everything I've done on film. Um, and, and it's only just the recent years that digital has just taken over very quickly. Um, How is that for you? Is your crew more used to working with digital cameras now? No, no, no. The crew are still, you know, good old boys that have done, or women who have done film for years and years. Um, there isn't, I mean, I've always respected the idea that when the camera's rolling, it costs a lot of money. I think the digital age has somewhat allowed people to just keep rolling and rolling and rolling, and you tend to lose some of the focus. Uh, We've that done a bloated it. budget age. Yes, I know, but we've kind of made it a little more very focused on the scene, the cuts and the shots, you know, the way you make movies. It's and nice for a change. Yes. <laughs> and then can you tell me about anything movie magic-wise, something that you had a little bit of a trick to do on set that when we see on screen is going to have that magical quality to it? Ooh, there's a lot of that. I mean, uh, I've always loved... Uh, invisible effects you know when you think you see something and you're actually being manipulated I never liked when I felt manipulated um, but there are enhancements all the time you know it's like 
when Dorothea turns into a demon, there's creepy stuff happening to her, which you can only do with computers. Uh, there's some amazing sets where we built a third of it and the rest is all green screen. Um, and I don't think you can see where the set stops and the green screen begins. Um, but to me, I just never really wanted anybody to walk out of there thinking, oh, that was a great effects movie. I just think people should walk out of there thinking, wow, that's a great world. And is there anything in terms of the finer details that you put in there, whether it's a prop, a certain shot that you really appreciate, that, that you want people to take notice of that they might not because of the expansive world? Well, there's um, in the in the city of bones where all these shadow hunters are buried there's an eyeball above every skull that's something people can look for there's the famous uh, soccer team flag that I stick into every single one of my movies <laughs> try to find that one and uh, I mean it was important for us to to make you feel like this world had existed for hundreds of years that we were just seeing a little slice of something that had been around for for eternity so we put a lot of effort into the textures and the aging and the details so every little bolt and staircase in the Institute is very crafted for that with that idea and now I know you don't want to get ahead of yourself but looking on to the possibility of making future films what happened to all this stuff that you built and, and all the costumes and everything do you tuck it away and save it <clears throat> yeah yeah it's um there's a word for that that I don't remember right now but it's where you uh, you wrap it and you save it so all the sets are carefully stowed away in, in, a, in a storage, and they can just be assembled back up again in, in a few weeks' time. And what it, where is your mind at with that? Are you preparing to go? Yeah, into I'm the deep next into one? prepping the next one already. We're starting to shoot in September. So it's official. It's a go. Y yes, yes. <laughs> I, I don't know if that's more pressure for this one coming out or less because you know you're going to get to keep going. Yeah, good question. <laughs> I wish I could answer that. And is there anything you're planning to do for that one that's going to, you know, change things up but make it still feel like the same world? Yeah, I mean, uh, it will be going deeper into behind more doors and seeing more characters and evolving the demons to even more scary than they were in the first movie. Yeah. And now how scary are we talking about? Are younger well, I, kids going to be able to watch this and be okay? Yeah, I think I, I, I enjoy watching the audience on a couple of really key moments in the movie where I see them all jump. Um, younger kids can see, you know, there's it's a PG-13 movie. Um, I think the grown-ups will jump as well. The book has some scenes that almost have like a horror, like nightmarish tone to them. Do you preserve that in the movie? Yeah. Yeah, no, that's all there. I think we found a great balance of, you know, you mentioned Harry Potter and the magic of that, but also good, scary scenes. Do you have any inspirations from that? Well, uh, The Exorcist, for me, was a great inspiration. Um, yeah, I think that's the one I watched the most to learn how to scare people. It's a good one to go with. Yes, I know. It's one of my favorite movies. And now you said you tucked away most of the stuff for the next film, but is there anything that you kept and took home? Um, I might have kept a little piece of jewelry or two. Not this one, though. This one is made specially for me. It's beautiful. That's nice. Right? That's gorgeous. Yes, this is from the high-end version of the jewelry line we have. You can get it on mortalinstrumentsjewelry.com. That's a good plug there. Yes. And I'm going to be going to later. Yes. And can you tell me just a little bit about being here at Comic-Con and maybe what you're expecting from your panel or hoping for? Well, <clears throat> I'm hoping they're going to ask everybody else questions because I'm really nervous. <laughs> I can't wait to meet, meet them all. Um, I just think Comic-Con is fantastic. I just, I'm going to, after the panel, I'm just going to walk around on the floor and just take it all in. If you got to walk around on the floor and dress up as anybody you wanted, who would it be? Well, I always wanted to be a stormtrooper, but I guess I was just too short to be a stormtrooper. <laughs>